My name is Ken Myers, and I am here to talk about what the Bible does not say about the end of time. So here's the plan. I'm going to talk about maybe for half an hour, and I'm only going to give an introduction this evening, and I'll come back. If the introduction doesn't scare you off, I'll come back next week and, uh, and pick up where we left off. So let me tell you a little bit about who I am. I am a, uh, a Pentecostal preacher's kid. I grew up helping my father study for sermons on the end times. When I was 12 years old, I was in the Bible helping him study things like Matthew 24 and the book of Revelation. And I knew at that age how to draw all the charts I knew all the ups and downs. I knew everything there was. Everything you hear these TV evangelists and these radio preachers talk about that just kind of scares the daylights out of you, I learned that stuff when I was a kid. And then I became a pastor, and I preached that stuff. And the more I preached it, the less it made sense. And I was in the middle of teaching the book of Revelation to a congregation when I was 24 years old, and... First of all, why does a congregation have a pastor who's 24 years old? That never made sense to me after the fact, but it was a God thing. And so in the middle of teaching, about six or eight weeks into the class, I went to the congregation on one Wednesday night and I said, folks, I don't believe anything I've been teaching you. And they just looked kind of shell-shocked and said, well, what do you believe? And I said, I don't have a clue. I just know what I don't believe. Give me a year to dig in and study, to read some history, to read some theology, to look at what others have said, and I'll get back with you. And they said, well, why don't we just do this together? You study and get back with us and tell us what you're exploring. And, and for a year, we did that, and it was marvelous. My guess is if you grew up in church, my guess is you have one of two understandings about the end times. You have the popular understanding that has been written about and millions of books sold and the Left Behind series tells about and all the movies tell about. You have that understanding or you have no understanding because what much of the church has done is just said let's not talk about it and consequently that creates a vacuum and a vacuum demands to be filled and so in comes this popular view that's that's full of, uh, of terrifying things and rather pessimistic outlook on the future so what I'm going to do tonight is introduce you to three options. And I'm going to do a magic trick for you. Don't get too excited. There are only three biblical, when I say biblical, there are only three views of the future that are based on Scripture. And they all hinge around a phrase found in Revelation 20, and that phrase is 1,000 years. Or, if you would like the Latin version, mille anum, or if you were to smash it all up, Millennium. Revelation 20 tells this story about there being a war, a heavenly, spiritual, supernatural war, in which Satan is defeated. And the Bible says in Revelation 20, and Satan was bound for a thousand years 
that he might deceive the nations no longer. That phrase, thousand years, millennium, becomes a kind of touch point for every view of the end times that Christians have. By the way, the 29 cent word for the study of end times is eschatology, the study of last things. Every view of eschatology is pinned to this text in Revelation 20. So I'm going to give you three options. Two of them I'm going to dismiss. One of them we're going to explore over the next few weeks. The first view, I'm only going to touch on it momentarily, is called post-millennialism. Post-millennial. And it is a view that says, <clears throat> excuse me, there is a literal 1,000-year time period of peace and prosperity and Satan being bound and war ceasing and so forth. And at the end or after or post that time period, Jesus comes back. This view was very popular in the late 1800s, uh, particularly among Presbyterian folk, Reformed folk. Uh, it, it began to catch on. And then after world, because, because they thought they were entering into this age. I mean, think about what was going on in the late 1800s. Worldwide, uh, the Industrial Revolution, Food was becoming more plentiful. Work was becoming less difficult. Um, slavery had ended in America. Um, it just seemed like things were getting better. And we're, we're at the dawn of this millennium. We're at the dawn of this thousand years of peace. And then suddenly, World War I comes along. And that all on a popular level comes crashing down. It's like, wait a minute, this is not what we thought was going to happen. <clears throat> and so that view began to diminish. But you still see it here and there, particularly in Reformed circles. The second view is the opposite of the first view. It's called premillennialism. It too believes in a literal 1,000 year period of time during which Satan is bound, Christ rules literally from Jerusalem, but he comes back, the second come, the, the return, Jesus comes back before this 1,000 year period. Now, I don't want to get too complicated here. But there are two subdivisions of this. There's something called historic premillennialism. And you can see it a little bit in the early church. And you can see it in some good, solid theologians of the last 50, 100 years. That says basically just this. Jesus comes back. There's a 1,000-year rule of Christ on the earth where he rules the nations and then Judgment Day and the new creation. But there's another kind of premillennialism called, and I know this is like a lot of data for you, but called dispensational premillennialism. This is the view that pretty much any church in the Texoma area that has an eschatology embraces. There are a lot of churches in the Texoma area that don't have an eschatology. And so they don't embrace this, but they don't have anything else they embrace. This is the view that Tim LaHaye writes bestsellers about in the Left Behind series that back when I was a kid, how Lindsay wrote multi-million dollar, I mean multi-million copy bestseller called The Late Great Planet Earth that took the world by storm. This is the, uh, the movies are all based on this view. This view did not exist until the 1830s. 
If you want to find this view in, say, John Wesley or Martin Luther or Augustine or anybody before the 1830s, not there. This view also still is not embraced by most of Christianity. It just happens to be embraced by that popular portion of Christianity in the culture in which we happen to live. Southern evangelicalism and Pentecostalism. This view is so popular and so commonly accepted that around these parts, if you don't accept this view, there's something wrong with you. You're, you're probably not a real Bible believer. You're probably a heretic. I don't know that you're even Christian. You're teaching something false. Is this going online? Never mind then. No, I, I don't. What? You will not. I'll tell you. I'll tell you later. I'm blushing. I'll tell you after, as as the glorious P.S. I'll tell you. <clears throat> Let me draw you a map of this view. Dispensational. Premillennialism. It starts with, we'll say this is the, the, the death, burial, resurrection, ascension of Jesus. We'll give it a date of about AD 30. Christ dies, rises from the dead, ascends into heaven. And then we have this undefined time called the church age, which we are living in now. It's been going on for 2,000 years. Sometime at the end of that church age, Jesus comes back. But you thought we were talking about second coming. No, we're not. Because he doesn't come all the way to the ground. It's a kind of drive-by rapture. <laughs> he comes back and swoops back up. I sound like I'm making fun of this. <laughs> but this is the true doctrine in which I was schooled. And in that moment, we who are alive at that time are caught up to meet the Lord, but we don't precede those who have died. They rise from the dead. So, my, you know, my granny and my papa, they rise from the dead. And my sweet wife, she rises from the dead. And then I rise from the dead, and we're all caught away. Everybody say caught away. We're caught away to heaven. And for seven years... This is rapture. For seven years, all hell breaks loose on earth. It's called the great tribulation. Man, it gets nasty. The Christians are all gone. Pretty much, I mean, like the church is gone. And what's left behind is famine and chaos and the Antichrist and the mark of the beast and, and one world government. And, and if you don't worship the Antichrist and take his mark, you can't buy or sell and you get your head cut off. And it's just, it's, it's awful. Israel just gets the living daylights beat out of it. And at the end of that seven years, oh, by, during this seven years, we're in heaven somewhere. Far beyond the blue. Just over in the glory land. Out yonder. And, 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 at, and at the end of this time, Jesus comes back. But this time he comes back all the way, and we follow him. So Jesus comes back, boom, this is called the second coming. And we follow him 
riding on horses, mind you. And this massive final battle happens called the Battle of Armageddon. Jesus comes back. He defeats the enemy, takes over the world, and sets up his kingdom. Mind you, in this theology, the kingdom of God does not exist until this point. Sets up his kingdom, and, drum roll, here we go, for a thousand years, Jesus and we rule and reign on the earth. Now, what I'm about to describe to you sounds kind of like a Marvel comic book, but it's not. It's dispensational theology, and here's what it is. Mind you, during this thousand years, there are still mere mortals living on the earth, people that survived that seven-year horrible tribulation. They're still living. They're marrying. They're having kids. They're dying. They're living life as normal. We, on the other hand, who got raptured and spent seven years in heaven and come back with Jesus, we are immortals. We have defeated death. We have conquered with Christ. And so we are these, for lack of a better word, these overlords who rule and reign over the mere mortals. We are these immortals ruling and reigning with Christ over these mere mortals. And he has his capital set up in Jerusalem in a newly built temple where, mind you, blood sacrifices are once again offered to him. At the end of this thousand years, Satan is let loose for a little while. He rallies a bunch of people to him. There's one more skirmish. God puts it down quickly. And then we have judgment day on which most people are sent to hell forever. And we immortals and those who followed our ways later spend eternity with God in the new heavens and the new earth. You should be impressed that I did all of that without looking at a single note because I have this memorized from the time I was 12. I'm going to erase it. Everybody got it? You could draw this. There's going to be a test. There's a third view. And this is the view that we're going to be talking about for the next couple of weeks. It's called not post-millennial, not even pre-millennial. It's called ah-millennial. Ah being the prefix for no. No millennium. No literal 1,000 years. And, you know, you, you, you put your arms on your hips and you tap your foot and go, what, do, what did you just do? What do you mean, no literal? Mo- Wait a minute. The only f- time we see that period mentioned is in the book of Revelation, which is a highly symbolic book. I mean, it says at the beginning, this is a book of symbols, and it talks about things like seven-headed dragons coming up out of the sea, and no one, no one that I've ever heard in all my life says, there's really going to be a real seven-headed dragon come up out of the sea. No, it represents something else. And so why, when we get to Revelation 20, and it talks about the thousand years, do we suddenly insist, this is literal? Oh, and by the way, every other Time, the number 1,000 is used in the Bible every other time. It's symbolic. For example, Psalm 50. God says, I own the cattle on a thousand hills. How many hills does God own the cattle on? Pretty much all of them. Exactly 1,000. 1,000 and not 1,001. And not 999. I pastored in a little 
town in northern Wisconsin for four years in St. Croix County. And when you entered the county line, they had this beautiful wooden sign that said, Welcome to St. Croix County, County of a Thousand Hills. And it was dairy country, so every one of those hills had cows on it. So Psalm 50 saying God owns all the cows in St. Croix County? No, no. A thousand hills means all the hills. Another text, uh, Exodus chapter 20, verse 4, it's the second commandment. You shall not bow down to graven images. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing mercy to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. So the thousand and first generation comes along and loves God and keeps his commandments, and he goes, sorry, too late. No, it means all, all the generations. In our day and age, if we were going to have a picnic next summer, and, you know, we're out at the lake, and it's been raining, and it's kind of muggy, and we set up a tent, and one of us walks in slapping our arms and saying, there's a million mosquitoes out there. We weren't being literal. Nobody counted a million mosquitoes. What we mean is all the mosquitoes in the world are right out. And so this view, ah, millennialism, says there is no literal millennium, but that period of time described in Revelation 20 is a description of the church age, the age in which we're living, where Satan is progressively being bound, where the nations are more and more and more having the light of Christ shine and are being brought into the faith. So I'm going to draw you that chart. Again, we start with the ascension, death, resurrection, ascension of Jesus. Give it a date of AD 30. Jesus ascends. At some point in the future, Jesus comes back. That's judgment day when he makes all things new. in the heavens and on the earth. That's the chart. Even if I'm wrong, my chart is a lot easier to draw and a lot easier to remember. I just did a magic trick that you didn't see because you weren't watching closely enough. And I'm going to spend the next couple of weeks showing you how I did that trick. But first, let me tell you what trick I just did. I took the millennium and made it disappear. And you saw how I did that because I told you it's a symbolic time period. It's the church age. But the other thing I did that none of you saw, you didn't even see me do it because I was so sly. I made the seven-year tribulation disappear. It's not there. It's not a part of our future. It's not anything we anticipate. It's not anything we fear. It's not anything we escape. How did I do that? For the next couple of weeks, I'm going to show you what happened to the great tribulation. But I'm going to give you a homework assignment first, and that is this week, once or twice or three or four times, read Matthew 24, 1 through 36. This is the passage, by the way, from which we get the phrase, Great Tribulation. Read it, and when I come back next week, we're going to start looking at this verse by verse, and seeing what the Bible actually says about our future. Amen. Comments or questions before, we, uh, before I sit down? It is kind of Star Wars. It's the Millennial Falcon, right?
which crashed in San Francisco out in the mountains, right? You know this. The Millennial Falcon crashes and Han Solo dies, but Chewbacca lives and becomes the progenitor of Bigfoot. And a couple of generations later, Indiana Jones goes and discovers the Millennial Falcon in his search for Bigfoot. That's, that's, that's actually fan fiction, and it makes total sense. Okay, are you done recording?